questions about, you know, when you're talking about setbacks and, you know, corners and all these things, obviously we all got the correspondence this afternoon and um, some of these things that even came up with that are, um, we, we have, I guess, I mean, it's my understanding we can't just add whatever we feel like in terms of what would be good for our community unless, however, it's life safety or environmentally, you know, impacted. Is that correct? Like, basically, we can't really go beyond what the state um, rules are or make them more restrictive in any way unless we can prove that there's life safety and environmental concerns. Is that? That is um, correct. Um, the state ADU law does allow us to apply objective standards to the creation of ADUs. And a lot of what this letter speaks to is a specific type of ADU under government code section 66323, which is a statewide exemption ADU. Um, and those, there's a few different types of statewide exemption ADUs. Um, but basically, like the most common one is like a new construction detached ADU up to 800 square feet with four foot side and rear setbacks and a height of 16 feet. So I've been working closely with HCD on developing these changes and they confirmed we can apply our objective standards to all ADUs, including statewide exemption ADUs, to the extent that we're not directly conflicting with what is provided for the statewide exemption ADU. So we can't apply a standard that makes it only 14 feet tall, or we can't apply a standard that forces it to be less than 800 square feet. That's why um, the proposed amendments include um, this objective way to waive standards in order to allow those ADUs um, where they would otherwise be precluded. And we develop them, um, you kind of mentioned um, protecting resources and safety, et cetera. We developed them in that way specifically to create a hierarchy of what we wanted to protect more and what we're more willing to give up um, in order to protect the city's interest while also um, giving flexibility to the applicant to figure out which standards they're going to waive in order to make their ADU work. Thank you. Mr. Van Wong. Thanks again. I just wanted to add uh, briefly again uh, as, as to that letter. Uh, like Clara said, a bulk of that letter related to the state exemption ADUs and whether uh, standards could be applied to them or not. Um, we believe that the way they read the law says that standards can't be applied flat out. But Clara's worked really closely with HCD throughout this process, and they have supported us using standards so long as they don't preclude the state exemption ADUs. Uh, and that was, that was a, a large bulk of that letter. There's a few other things we're still cleaning up with or checking with our city attorney on, mm -hmm. um, but we're confident on, on that reading. Thank you for that clarification. Did you have anything else? Commissioner Dan. Thanks. Um, so I just have a, a few clarifying questions just to make sure I'm understanding exactly what we're doing here. So um, I'm going to start with the ADUs. So I understand... Um, but the owner occupancy requirements per state law for the uh, period between 2020, 2025, and then there is another law after 2025. So are we not required to get rid of the owner occupancy for pre-2020 ADUs then? Because that was unclear to me in the staff report, and then I read the law and it seemed like we did have to get rid of the owner occupancy requirement for all ADUs, but then... What I'm hearing from you is that actually maybe that that is optional. So I just want some clarification there. What it, what the state is requiring us to do with owner occupancy post 2020 and pre 2020. My understanding of the law is that we can no longer require owner occupancy for new ADUs that are constructed moving forward in 2025 and beyond, but we can impose that requirement on pre-2020. So we can ADUs. retain the owner occupancy requirement for ADUs constructed before 2020? That's my understanding. Okay, thank you. That was not clear to me, but now it's clear. Thank you. Um, and then for the condo conversions, to be quite honest with this one, um, 
I just don't really understand functionally how this would work on a single family parcel. So if you have, I, so I live in a condo and have for the last 22 years. I understand very well what, what you are buying when you buy a condo, you're buying airspace. You, the association owns everything else. Um, so if you have a main house and an ADU, um, do both have to be condoized? Because how do you have one, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me how that would functionally work. Um, and it, so I think we all need an explanation about that um, before we move forward. Um, and I actually would just say in general, I, I think this is kind of an experiment. And uh, so my second question is, what other jurisdictions have done this? <laughs> and what has happened? <laughs> Um, good question. So the way we have this written on a on a lot with a single family home and an ADU or maybe a couple of ADUs, um, they would all be mapped as condominiums. So is that and the then, requirement then that every dwelling in the, on the parcel must become a condo? Yeah, and then create and then, an association and, then, and exactly. Okay. So they would have their little association, um, and this is very new. Yes. Um, the city of San Jose has passed an ordinance, and they just did that a couple months ago, I think in June. Um, I don't know how that's going. It, it might be too soon to tell. Um, Maybe so we should so. find out first. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, Can I jump in on that really quickly? Sure. Recognize Commissioner Kennedy. I happen to have a fairly rectangular, about 5,000 square foot lot with like a single family home. And we looked at a SB9 lot split versus a condo. And the difference for me was like $85,000 of sewer and electrical line and all this other junk. So in my very self-interested case, it might be an option to save a big expense. You know, if you're willing to deal with a condo, you could avoid some infrastructure. I don't know if that helped. I mean, I think it helps knowing that um, it wasn't clear in the staff report that all the <coughs> dwellings on the parcel would be, so I couldn't understand how you would have keep a single family home that owned fee title to the land so weird. and have a condo. But now what I understand is everything on the parcel would have to be condoized. I think it's important to make that distinction so people who understand how condominium projects works understands how this would functionally work. It, now I understand and it makes sense and I can see how that could happen, whether or not it's a good idea and what it will do to our, our housing prices and rental stock, whatever, is, is, is an open question, I think. Um, but yeah, those are my only questions for right now. OK, follow-up question. Well, I just wanted to make a comment that there is a four-unit development that is in Seabright, some, I think, on Frederick Street or right off of Frederick Street that has um, done this just recently. And I mean, in the last like year or so, and so they separated all four of them. Um, so there is some precedent for doing that here in the community. And, you know, it's designed well, planned well. Was it well. new construction? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I believe that it was two, it was, uh, yeah, it's at four units and it was. Yeah, I think with new, new construction, I can see that makes sense. I think what's, what's, interesting and new about this is that this would be taking existing dwellings on a parcel in a house that owns fee title to the land and completely upending that. And um, I don't know if that's going to be attractive to people or not. Well, it's still subject to David Sterling, and um, which you know provides some guidance for it. And I think the land would be treated differently than it would be in a townhome development. Well, no, condos are different than townhomes, for sure. But we're talking about condoizing, not creating townhomes. Exactly. So these would now, the association would own fee title, not an individual. That's what condos are. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, you know, I, I get it, you know, and, and they would have to follow those rules and create an association. I just wasn't clear who the association would be with, um, since it wasn't clear to me that all dwellings would be condoized. I have one more question that's okay, unrelated to this, unless we have still more to talk about. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, I also Just, have some comments, but go ahead on this. Um, one. one question I do have is that these pre-2020 units that are deed restricted, do we have a process at this point 
um, or set up at this point for what these people can expect in, 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 in undeed restricting this? Process. Yes, we do. Um, so we we do require deed restrictions for all ADUs, um, and and there are a variety of things in those deed restrictions. One of them is an owner occupancy requirement for those pre twenty twenty ADUs. So what we would do is we would, um, if the owner requests to have that removed, we would create an amended deed restriction for them, um, and they would just take that to the county and record it, and that would supersede their existing deed restriction, and then we would have a copy of it, and the county would have a copy, and then everyone would be happy. And do we have a sense of what fees might be associated with that, if any? There's no fee from the city. Um, the county, I think, does have a small recording fee, which is mm -hmm. maybe $20, mm -hmm. yeah. I had a question following up on that as well, which is um, I wondered why it wouldn't just be done by operation of law. So if the ordinance that required owner occupancy is null and void, um, I want, as happens from time to time on many land use you know, issues, and if that's no longer in place, then that should be null without a process. Um, that was my question about that anyway which would simplify, per, per, make it less work for everybody. So in other words, it's unenforceable. Um, it's gone extinct, essentially. But maybe there's other reasons why the city would like to record new, new restrictions. Um, I would need to look into that further. I don't know if, if Matt knows more about that. Um, but I can examine that further to see if it can be done without deed restrictions. I know owners a lot of the time Sometimes we have deed restrictions that have old rules, right. and they ask about yeah. it, and we say that doesn't apply anymore. Sometimes they want that just removed, so it doesn't cause any confusion if they want right. to sell the property, et cetera. Um, but I can look at if, if we can just say it's done, and you don't need Magic to change wand. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, OK, we have a couple more questions. Commissioner Paul Hamas. Thank you, and thank you for your very clear staff report. It cleared up a lot of the questions I've had. Um, yeah, I, th this is sort of like a comment and a question, I guess, but I guess I'm just thinking about an ADU owner who now has to go down to the county to remove the deed restric restriction and spend that time and do that, and then also enroll in this residential um, inspection program and, and do all these things. And I don't know, it just seems like it would leave, if I was an ADU creator before 2020, it would leave kind of a bad taste in my mouth. So I'm just curious if there's any sense uh, to, um, if you are, say, an on-site owner for an existing ADU, is there any way to waive the uh, residential inspection aspect? Or does it make sense to do that? And as I understand, it's that would be a very small amount of people, right? Roughly 260-ish? Um. Do you kind of see where, what I, I'm I getting at? I understand. So yeah. if the owner lives on the, if they're, if they're still occupying the property and they're directly overseeing their ADU, um, that's something that we did talk about a little bit. Um, when we have multifamily properties like duplexes where an owner lives in one of the units, they are still required to enroll in the rental program, uh, the rental inspection program. So from that perspective, it keeps things fair um, among the different uh, rental property owners. Um, we can look into it further if you'd like. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking like if I built an ADU in 2013 and I jumped through all the hoops and did all the things and then uh, the law changed and then now I'm going to be told, okay, if you want to remove the owner restriction or the owner occupancy deed restriction, you're going to have to go down to the county to deal with that. And then you're going to also have to enroll in this new program and pay for it. And it's not huge fees. It's not, you know, but it is time. It is energy. It is all those things. So I think it's just maybe something that might deserve a look um, in terms of whether that's absolutely necessary for people who have done the right thing, who have changed nothing, and the laws around them have changed again, and now they're required to do all these other things. I just don't think that if I was that person, I wouldn't like that. Mr. Van Wa, do you have a response? Yeah, thanks. Just to, to add to that, the, the ADU owners post-2020 have that same requirement. Mm -hmm. 
So in terms of fairness, there's no difference there. The only, the only change would be that those ADU owners pre-2020 would would have to go to the county and, and mm -hmm. change their deed for now based on that. Mm -hmm. So all the, all the owners would have to go through that residential inspection service process. Um, but like Clara said, there's a number of waivers and fee reductions that can be done through that. So if you're renting to family members or using it as your office, for instance, um, and then also inspection uh, reductions as well. Um, and then it, the ones that would still have to go through that, that process, that's really just to ensure that all rental units across the city of Santa Cruz are inspected in the same way and meet the same health and safety standards as, as every other one. So right. it's really to support yeah, tenants' rights and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's, that makes sense. Thank you. I have a further comment on the same point as well. I guess I'm not making my own comments. I'm just jumping in on everybody else's tonight. Um, two things. One, I'm one of those owners, and I don't mind it at all um, because I think for purposes of fairness. But the other thing that I really like about it is um, having spent a lot of years trying to find incentives um, for landlords to rent to people with housing choice vouchers. Um, it's one of the answers. you know. So if you really don't like it, rent to someone with a housing choice voucher and it gets even simpler. But I do think that the restriction could just, you know, die on the vine um, through operation of law. I mean, if, if, you know, city staff can figure out that that works, um, I think that would be an advantage. Also, it might, it might take away the sting. Well, and that segues <laughs> very nicely into my next question. Okay, um, so as I read the staff report uh, with relocation assistance for a converted ADU, if they're, you know, they're given right of first refusal and they refuse it, and then there's uh, a move-out situation that occurs. So I interpreted the relocation assistance, it was sort of vague, but the four months of relocation assistance, as I read it, was only offered to the lower income or moderate income people. <laughs> Did I read that wrong or what? That's correct. Okay, so in the staff report that, that you just gave, I heard it was four months for everybody. So it, I did say that in the presentation. In and the presentation. And that in tonight I said that and that was incorrect and thank you for pointing that okay. out. So the staff, Sorry. the staff report is correct. So it would be for low or moderate income. Okay. Um, um, and in the existing code with let me see, I struck all this. In the existing code, it, I think you said it said one and a half months in the situation where 67% of tenants purchase and then that other 33%, they're given 1.5 months in existing code, no matter who they are. I don't think so. Was that wrong? That, I think it's still low. I'd have to double check that. So our code actually contradicts itself potentially <laughs> so and we need to clean that yeah. up the subdivision ordinance says the sub, right the subdivision ordinance says one and a half months and i'm not sure if it says for everyone or just for low and moderate income people uh, people <laughs> tenants um separately in the zoning ordinance we have a residential um, um demolition and conversion authorization permit um, that would require two months of relocation assistance for low and moderate income tenants. So that's a discrepancy that needs to be resolved. Okay, yeah, and this was in the, this was in the, uh, the strike through document for the non-local coastal program. Correct, and the second, ordinance. So and it was kind of like buried in there and I just kind of noticed and I was like, okay, it's like four, it's two, it's one and a half, like what's going on here? So um, I'm not sure what to do about that. Um, I don't, I don't know if four months makes sense for everybody, but certainly I think two is, is reasonable. Um, and if you're paying, you know, $3,000 a month, the difference between half a month's rent, that's, that's 1500 bucks. That's a lot of money. <laughs> so something to just look at. Um, okay. I just wanted to um, point out that we have delved much further into our discussion without opening up to the public, and this was intended to be time for questions. We've gone way far over that into deliberation, but I'm wondering if you, we could ask to hold comments until we do open up to the public, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so thank you. Um, sorry I let that happen. It's obviously a very gripping conversation. Um, so at this point, um, I would like to open the public hearing and invite anybody who's here to address um, the commission to please speak. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. 
and welcome. Thank you. It's it's really fun to be here that just to see this whole thing working. My name is Doreen Tai. I am a retired registered nurse from Dominican Hospital. I worked there for 42 years. Um, I have a beautiful home in SoCal, and it's a four bedroom house. And I had three. I have three children. So now my point is one of my sons with his baby and wife lived down on Water Street at the low income type of housing. And uh, there's smoking going on, there's this, and I in my heart as a mother said, oh my gosh, we have to do something. So how much does the, um, do you, does your property tax change with an ADU? Okay, we'll take all your questions. Um, and is there permits to be done with an ADU? Um, is there a lot size restriction for the ADU? And so this would be my situation is multifamily. Um, so that's why I came down, just to check things out. I read the Sentinel. Mm -hmm. So anyway, thank you. If anyone can answer those questions. Thank you very much thank for you. your comments. And uh, uh, we appreciate those comments. With that, I'm going to close the public hearing. There's no other members of the public he here. We generally don't answer questions um, one by one, but we are very interested in you having access to um, all of the information you need, either through the staff report or through connecting with a staff person here this evening. Um, OK. So just to exchange numbers and make sure yeah. you're connected uh, with one of these folks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah but still. That's okay. We'll address that. I like okay. ADs even Thank you. We'll come back to. <laughs> yeah. Understood. Okay. So uh, with that, um, we will return to the commission. We'll, we will continue our deep deliberations and discussion. And Commissioner Polhamus, you had further comments? Yes. Thank you. I just had one more question. Um, so I'm thinking too about, and <clears throat> I've heard you say on multiple occasions, the the owner, when you start mapping condos and you have different ownership, mm -hmm. it can be difficult to manage, mm -hmm. right? And I've heard, the, I've heard that a few times now. And one of the questions I have, so current law allows the conversion of storage spaces into ADUs and then ADUs into condos, correct? Which could then be mapped and sold. On um, say, and I don't want to call out any particular project, but a multifamily project with, say, 10 storage spaces, which we are then uh, obligated to allow conversion to ADU under state law, and then those ADUs could then be yeah. condoized, correct? Uh, that's So conversion of non-habitable space to an ADU in a multifamily development is a statewide exemption ADU, so that is allowed. And if we were to implement an ordinance um, the way that it is written right now for condoization of an ADU, those could then be mapped as condos and sold separately. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump in. Most of my questions have been answered through the, through the course of this, this discussion. Um, and I, I would like to make one comment, and I appreciate the streamlining and the simplification um, for the purpose of addressing the housing crisis. And I just want to mention that I really strongly support not allowing ADUs to become short-term rentals. Um, you know, they can go through the application process. And, um, you know, we've lost a lot of housing, and many, as we, you know, as happens all over the place, um, to short-term rentals. And um, I do think that in encouraging ADUs to be built and encouraging additional housing units to be created through, you know, lightening the touch on, on the regulations is a good thing and that they shouldn't be short-term rentals. So I really appreciate the, that clarification um, and that that's part of, part of the action that we're taking tonight. Um, and also on the condo conversion, I'm glad to see that there are some tenant um, protections, um, but, you know, uh, selling ADUs um, separately, we do lose rental housing, and we need rental housing. 
Um, so, I mean, I understand, you know, why we're doing it and how we're doing it. I'm personally not, not crazy about it. I hope we don't see a lot of it. And um, I know watching the condo conversion ordinance, which, you know, I ran up against in various capacities over the decades, um, it was there for a really, you know, um, a purpose. It also blocked some potential affordable units and, you know, it had unintended consequences. So I just want to um, weigh in on that. We are losing something there. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I think that's it for, for my comments. Does anybody have any anything further? I do. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, I actually just wanted to respond to your comment about losing rental housing, and I just feel like it's important to point out that a lot of what we're seeing in our approval process is for rent, and it's... Uh, our state laws uh, prohibit really at this moment, and I know it's on the Senate floor at some point, or there's discussion about it, but it makes it very difficult for us to create housing for purchase. And so although I agree with you that we're losing renting, rental housing, this is actually the only way that our community can create affordable by design for purchase. Because I, as far as what we've all seen in the time I've been on the Planning Commission, there hasn't been one project that's come across that's for sale. And there are people out there that want to buy as much as there are people out there that want to rent. And the only way that we can have a middle class is if they can actually buy property. And so we're not going to be able to, as developers or architects or investors or whatever you want to you know, call it, is is this right now until some of these um, restrictive legal um, you know, issues are solved when you have these um, responsibilities that are put on the developer for an extended period of time that make it cost, prohib cost prohibitive. So, um, so I do hope that we see a lot of them because there are teachers and all kinds of people that can afford to buy a house if it's in a reasonable price range, and this will be that. So I, I'm excited about it for a lot of people. And I just want to be clear, I'm in, definitely in favor of um, home ownership as well. And for a little perspective, until the laws changed, we never saw rental housing. So we, we have been seeing a lot of them come through. And um, so the reason that some of us get so tickled by them is that we just didn't see them at all. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah. I, I appreciate it's your really point, so. though. Mm -hmm. That's right, and it'll swing <laughs> right. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> that, that's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> Other comments? Commissioner Dan. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I have a similar um, feeling about wanting to um, think about uh, those who are in the market to purchase a home. Um, and is the reason why I'm actually um, opposed to removing the owner occupancy requirement because just being in the housing market, um, homes with ADUs are more expensive. Um, and if you remove the owner occupancy requirement, um, then you're just competing with speculators who are going to rent out both. And so that'll just raise the cost of, of, uh, of those lots. Um, so I'm not going to be able to support that and would strongly um, strongly argue for retaining that uh, provision to keep um, keep the cost of housing as low as we can. We don't, certainly don't need to do anything to make uh, single-family homes more expensive in this town. Um, and as far as the condo conversions, this is an optional uh, state law that we can opt into. And um, I would like to think that it's going to have the effect of um, making the dwellings more affordable. I think it might because condos, you don't own the land underneath. So, um, But I just can't see how that's really going to work out unless it's new construction. And I would rather go slow with this um, and see how it goes in other jurisdictions. I certainly wouldn't want... Um, staff to draft an ordinance and spend all the time doing that. Um, if this isn't something folks are going to take advantage of, um, you know, it's hard for me to imagine a situation where you have a, someone who owns a single family lot and the owner of the house wants to do this as opposed to doing an SB9 split. And so that makes me think maybe this 
would be attractive to speculators also, and that if you have a lot with a bunch of dwellings, then you want to buy that because you can condoize it. So that, again, creates competition for the person who just wants to buy the lot and move their family in and their grandmother or whatever. Um, so I kind of see this, again, could make housing more expensive in Santa Cruz. And I just think for, uh, for the condo conversion, I just can't support moving forward with that right now. I'd rather make a recommendation to the council that they take some time to study the issue, take a look at other jurisdictions that have done this and seen what happens. Have people, what, are, what are people doing? Is this, um, are people um, taking advantage of this or are they not? Um, and uh, just to see how that goes. Um, with the rest of it, I mean, we have to comply with state law and so I'm you know, perfectly happy to support um, the other parts of, of, um, of the staff recommendation, but for those two, I am not going to. Um, go ahead, Commissioner Kennedy. I want to return for one second to something Commissioner Gordon said. There's those whatever 200 um, that have the deed restriction already on their ADU lot that requires owner occupancy. I'm pretty sure there's no fee and that's just like a city county deed um, restriction because I just did one like last week. Um, so my question is, can you guys just proactively like, you know, clear that off so the property owner doesn't have, have to come ask for it? Because it seems like, it, I mean, that may be too hard to do, but that's my question. That was my point about the operation. Yeah, and I think that's what you're saying and maybe it's just different words to say the same thing. Because people are often surprised, like, what's deed restricted, you know. Did that make sense? Are you asking if we can waive the recording fee? Yeah, like, no. just go do all those. Oh, that we're the, asking the, city the staff the to draw. I don't yeah. think it has to be drawn up myself legally. I think you should. we can ask an attorney about that. I think it might just wither on the vine, but um, the city attorney could answer that. Um, rather than asking staff to create a new deed restriction yeah, for yeah. everyone already. That's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. that's. That's uh, not gonna yeah. happen, okay. I don't think that's a good thing. But I, would, I was just trying to save that person the run around back and forth, which it takes an hour, it costs zero dollars, but still. Commissioner Pohamas. So my understanding, and this is second hand, is um, the recorder is under the impression that the city can just send a letter or some sort of legal notice that just says that this is no longer a thing. Mm -hmm. And it's as simple as that. I don't, I don't think we need to do this individually. I, I mean, it's fair. based on what I've heard is that the city can just send a notice to the recorder and the, with the parcel numbers and who has these restrictions on their deed and just. I don't think they even have to do that. Okay. So just, just something to look into. We'll look into that, thank you. So then I had a real brief comment, and then I'm ready okay. to vote. Okay, I have a couple more. Is that all right? Or? Uh, maybe not quite, but go ahead, go ahead with your comments. Did you uh, uh, real quick, I, staff, I love those metrics. When you say it saves you $11,000, three months, and one public hearing, that's so great. Because that's <laughs> like, there it is. So just keep doing that. Oh, on the tentative map. Yeah, like the one developer brought up the list of like how much each change costs mm -hmm. them. That's really important. So keep doing that. I, I love that. Uh, rip from my day job, two Habitat for Humanity projects are taken advantage of mm -hmm. all these condo ADU mm -hmm. conjunctions. So that's cool. It's not just the evil people doing it. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 it's fantastic. And, and it was for that. But it's cool to see that in that context mm -hmm. for me. Um, yeah, and then I'm excited. I think this will put us back into poll position for the best ADU ordinance in the state. And uh, <laughs> I'm ready to vote for it. With I, that one little friendly um, okay. amendment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I know we had a couple of potential amendments that I'm sure we'll hear once we have a motion. But before we get to that point, I wanted to ask a follow-up question to Commissioner Dan's point um, about, um, you know, most of this is cleanup. It makes it all more streamlined, and it's much clearer to read. Once, once I got into actually reading it, I really think it clarifies it. And thank you for all that, because I know how... <laughs> There's long tendrils, um, so I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to understand more um, about the situation if we, if we were not to move on the um, condo conversion. 
um, property owners would still have the SB9 potential. And um, I'm not sure I'm completely clear, uh, although we've had a little bit of discussion about, um, so let's say I wanted to, I, I have a property that with a, on the alley ADU, and oops, I can't now do it as a condo, I can still do SB9. How does it compare? And um, it just as an example, if we had that one, um, I could st I could still create it as a separate lot. Only then it's not a condo; it's a it's a fee simple. Is that how that would work? Um, I think you could. Samantha's here, and she knows more about this than me. I think you could do it either way with SB nine, where you could create two smaller lots, or you could create condos. But I'm going to stop talking and let her talk here. <laughs> I'm trying to think while I walk up here very slowly. That's right. <laughs> um, <coughs> There's different criteria for an SB9 land division. So um, like in a perfect scenario, yes, you could do either one, but there's a list of specific criteria that the property needs to meet in order to be eligible. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that would be one difference. If you're not eligible for SB9, then you would potentially be eligible for condoizing mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. ADU. So maybe an alternative scenario in that. Mm -hmm. Can I just add one of the th things that would be a difference to, from a cost perspective, is that in an SB9 you'd have to have completely separate utilities where if you had an ADU that exists currently and you were trying to do this, you would not be required to get all separate meters, utilities, like all of the things which could save, it, it could make it even like cost prohibitive if sometimes not even possible. So. There is a, a difference there um, as well. So if we wanted to have the additional, more affordable by design home ownership, then we would want to support this um, ADUs as condo provision. Is that, that's what I'm taking from this. Does that sound correct? I think yeah. it is. And I think um, ADUs are also exempt from impact fees too, right? Would yes. that be the case for con mm -hmm. condo-wise? Because then it's no longer an ADU. If 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 you condoize the ADU, then there um, the subdivision ordinance regulations apply, and so there are certain mm -hmm. like public improvements that would need to be made mm -hmm. with regard to utilities. You might still need separate utilities. It's just the state law directs us to leave it up to the utilities. Okay. The water department, for example, typically does like to have separate utilities for condos. So they would likely ask for that, and that would be an expense. For new construction, right? I mean, this is only because... Yeah, yeah, I can tell you because I share yeah. a meter. Yeah. I mean, there's because a existing, if, if we're allowing this for existing, right, because that is a possibility, then it isn't. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not going to go back until you, you have to separate it. How that happens mm -hmm. in practicality of two people condoizing shared utilities is like a whole other thing. We don't know. Well, and I think that's a good point, too, because ADUs, by definition, were intended to be a dependent unit. Mm -hmm. yeah, so even yeah, if yeah. you have separate meters, yeah, exactly. um, they still, um, the you know, they time. come in at the same place. You can mm -hmm. bill separately so that you can charge, you know, the, the presumption was that you could charge your tenants utilities based on their actual use. Um, if you want to, but that doesn't have them separated. Um, and so then it's going to be... Anyway, it's a complicated matter, I guess. Is um, SB nine also has some regulations about touching the existing house that's there? Yeah. Like you literally can't do anything, any alterations to the existing house. So if somebody wanted to provide like access to the back of the lot for another unit, you can't modify that existing house. You have to go through a sort of a two step process. So, um, yeah, I think there are more regulations. One other really clear one is that SB9 requires a 60-40 percentage for the two new parcels. So think of that on a standard 5,000 square foot lot, whereas condo would not require that. So you could, in theory, carve out just my new 500 square foot ADU and sell, you know, give it to my one kid and give the other condo to another kid. That's just one <laughs> example. But 
Um, that might get them into this. Market. I guess I, it's right. just a lot of speculation, it though, is, right? It is, it so um, I don't know why we have to be the first one out of the gate on this. Um, mm -hmm. Fair. We have been before. <laughs> a lot, and it's gone pretty well. Well, yeah, I guess. Yeah, it depends. depends on what we want. Depends on yeah. what you yeah. want. <laughs> Commissioner Play Hamas. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a couple quick comments. I, I think that um, providing another avenue for smaller home ownership is, is a really good thing. And I think that there's a lot of good that <laughs> is in the ordinance before us. I do share the skepticism with the condos in terms of the conversion. I'm not saying that it couldn't work, but I think it's maybe worth a pause to maybe think about this a little bit more on that particular aspect. I think removing the owner occupancy requirement is fine, personally, um, because people can pretty much lot split and do that already. Um, however, the speculation comments from um, Commissioner Dan, I think, are real, um, and I think that we should be very careful about that. Um, the other thing, and I'm not sure how this might apply, and this is just becoming more of a reality with like the UCSC multifamily buildings that are going on down on the Lower West Side, I, is the university, is there any way to rein in this type of development done by, say, the university in the city? Or is there any place where that might come up? And the reason I ask is just because, like, I, I find what the university does in, in the housing area is like generally irresponsible. And um, I just don't, uh, I guess that's my question is, do these, is this ability extended to the university in the city as well? We can't, there's nothing to do up at the university itself, but say in the city, what can be done to rein in this type of thing because there's a lot going on there. Like, for example, their purchase of the uh, condos up at um, High Street, right, that were purchased and then rent just exploded. And that is at the behest of the Regents and the University. So I guess my question is just a broad, very broad legal question. And I, th I think that is a legal question. Yeah. Um, I think we would have to talk to our city attorney if there's any way to differentiate, like, right. what, I guess the question is what kind of ownership would be eligible for this type of project? Because I think people with good intentions would do the right thing when it comes to condo conversions, but there's always going to be those people that take the law you know, up as far as it can go and do things that aren't necessarily in the best interest of the community. So I think that's my holdup with the condo conversion thing where maybe it might be worth looking at this a little bit more closely before we just ride off into the sunset there. Okay. And Commissioner <laughs> has also Well, I just, I have some clarifying questions I, that I'm, so can I just run up the scenario? You are saying like UCSC buys an apartment building and they condoize it and turn those units into say, for sale? Or are you talking about creating ADUs? Like I'm trying to understand what the scenario well, because I'm, those are the two things we're sure. I, I'm because yeah. they're already doing the ADU part. That's a state law. Right, it's already happening. I guess I'm trying to understand the guardrails on this, if there are any, or if this is like once we put this through, this is just. I mean, I think the only thing that's optional in this, right, is the the condo yeah. conversion right. for sale component, and so I just was trying to get clear, like your concern if in relationship to UCSC and this condo conversion, like what does that scenario look like? Is it for and sale units for t professors that can actually afford to buy I, something? I think actually, and I appreciate your comments, but I think the frustration with the UCSC's impact on our housing market is widely felt. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes, but I'm not sure it's germane um, to the action before us tonight. I'm not seeing a nexus. Okay. Well, that's my question, really, is, is there one? Mr. Van Wa. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't believe we would be able to restrict a, a certain owner, for instance, on this, uh, but we will check with our attorney on that one. Uh, but just along those lines, I will say that 
uh, the aspects of this, these amendments uh, really are geared towards more single family, smaller ownership. Uh, the areas of this that are most streamlined are for you know, projects that are four units or less, I believe that's correct, Clara, mm -hmm. where projects that are more than that would have to go through a more significant yeah. approval process. Mm -hmm. So that, that is one aspect where we can, can, you know, control that and see those larger projects come through. Great. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, just, that was, I guess, my first concern, but it's more about um, the multifamily projects where I mm -hmm. get a little bit sketchier on the details. So I don't want to like hyper focus on UCSC because I don't think that's like the central idea here. It's really not. It's not. But mm -hmm. uh, okay. So uh, yeah, that's that, that's my comments. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And that larger project would have to go through that, yeah. you know, whatever process that larger project would be required to go through. Right. Right. Thank you. Thanks. All right, good. Well thank you everyone for your comments and thoughtfulness. Um, and I think we're, I feel like we're circling around, maybe getting ready to um, hear a motion. Are we at the point where someone is ready to make one? I move to pass the staff recommendation as written. I'll second that. Oh, oh did you have a comment? I just, want, I just wanted to ensure that uh, uh, the staff recommendation we, uh, we put up mm -hmm. in the presentation, mm -hmm slightly different than the one in the staff report. So I just want to okay. confirm that uh, Commissioner you Kennedy, that up? You, we added in the one uh, the one motion regarding if there are changes based on legal review. Uh, confirmed, per I, that got, letter I got that, that and that's make what changes. I want to include in this motion. Okay, I just wanted to make no, sure. No, that's very important. I should have said right. that the first time. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, do we have uh, further uh, discussion? I'm going to be voting no, and I think I already explained why. On the is. whole thing. <clears throat> yes, because I believe it includes mm -hmm. the condo conversion moving forward with that, which I am not recommending, and uh, the owner occupancy, which I feel pretty strongly about, will just raise home prices. Okay, so you're not going to, um, okay, that's fine. Um, so we'll go straight up, up and down, no, no amendments proposed. So I talked about that corner clearance thing and then having thought about it, that's not really about what we're looking at. Okay. So I'd love it if staff uh, voluntarily just could just break, explore that. that back to you staff. guys know what I'm talking about, but it's inappropriate to ram it in. It has very little to do with ADUs. Um, okay, anybody, no, no, no other changes being made, go ahead. Yeah, not so much an amendment or uh, anything else, but just to make sure that the tenant relocation thing gets passed along to council to sort of to just suss out and figure out what they want to do. I think two is reasonable for anybody, and four for low-income, moderate tenants is probably, I think, somewhere in that ballpark should get passed along. Okay, I can say I actually, I am going to vote for the motion, although I would have supported um, uh, taking the, um, delaying the condominium um, portion um, of this out of this action as well um, but as it, as it is going forward it's included so I'm just making a note of that any other comments uh, with that can we have a roll call vote Commissioner Dan no Gordon yes Kennedy yes Paul Hamas yes Thompson yes Chair Conway yes with that, um, the motion passes. And thank you for your thoughtfulness. Thank you for um, all of you, all of the staff for this. I know what a heavy lift it is um, and, uh, and it's not done. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, with that, do we have information items? Mr. Van Hoa. See, I got my name tag here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tess. <laughs> Thank you, Clara. So I, I have a, a number of items to, to go over because we haven't met for a few months. So <laughs> nice to be back and, and have a report for you all. Uh, so a uh, few items coming up. Uh, 9, 10, uh, September 10th, City Council. Uh, we have at the SB 35, uh, SB 423, which is a affordable housing streamlining. Uh, 
we have a consistency determination with that where council will be looking at uh, whether to further streamline uh, those affordable housing projects under these under these state laws. Um, the staff report for that's available online. Uh, also next week is Excuse the, me, could I ask you a clarifying question about mm -hmm. that? Does that <clears throat> only refer to 100% affordable projects or does it also apply density bonus projects? It applies to projects that uh, um, qualify for SB 35. SB 35 or SB 423, which could be 50%. Is that correct? Do you want to add something, Sam, there? Yeah. Um, the, the direction from council was actually pretty pretty broad, and so it would apply to any affordable housing affordable housing project that's um, available to use at the streamlining. So it could be like AB 2011. Okay. Um, and it's so it's any of those projects that also include a density bonus. So it's that little subset. Sam. And uh, next next week too, the the California Coastal Commission is meeting in uh, Monterey. So they're they're over in our neck of the woods uh, this month, and uh, the big item there is going to be the the cruise hotel. Um, and that's that's going to be on Thursday, and so that webcast is available to view, and the staff report's available online now for that. Uh, another item uh, on Wednesday is that uh, there's going to be there, the California Coastal Commission is hosting a local government workshop uh, on on that Wednesday afternoon, presenting their idea of a neighborhood scale approaches to sea level rise. This is in regards to local coastal programs. Um, and so in case any of you are interested in that as well, that's, that's, that's a newer topic that's coming through the Coastal Commission that they'll be presenting on. Um, and then at the 10A Council, um, we're expected to bring forward, we're anticipating bringing forward an update on our downtown expansion, uh, specifically providing some additional detail uh, on the affordable housing overlay proposal. Uh, for for specific uh, sites in that expansion area, uh, as well as some uh, initial work that we've done on uh, furthering our anti-displacement policies and how they may, some may be incorporated into the downtown plan uh, while others may move kind of concurrently through a larger formal process uh, as part of a larger citywide anti-displacement uh, work. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be pre presenting to council on those items. Um, in terms of upcoming planning commission items, uh, 919, our next meeting, uh, we have the, the Hampton Inn, uh, 1505 Ocean Street uh, wireless project that's on consent, and uh, 119 Madrone, which is the Woodhouse Brewery. Uh, it's a, a master permit, and, or master use permit, and a special use permit. Uh, regarding uh, live entertainment and high-risk alcohol uh, permits that they'll be applying for. And then um, the next planning commission that we have uh, have items currently scheduled for is uh, October 17th, and that'll be uh, our existing building decarbonization. Um, you remember last year we did, we did a first step uh, as far as uh, looking at our decarbonization work uh, kind of following a uh, new case law that, that struck down our natural gas ban. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had a, a, a new process in place for uh, new construction, and now we're bringing forward our first step in uh, existing construction. Uh, so that'll be going to Planning Commission in October 17th. Uh, and then later this year, um, our local coastal program, we're, we're currently and have been working with Coastal staff for some time on our uh, beaches and bluffs hazards adaptation policies, which is part of our local coastal program, or it's going to be a new chapter of our local coastal program. And uh, we're anticipating uh, a public review draft later this fall and uh, sometime before the end of the year, likely going to Planning Commission to present that work. Uh, it's somewhat tied a little bit actually to that neighborhood scale approaches and the the local coastal program work in general being presented at the, the Coastal Commission. Um, and then uh, 
One, one final thing too, uh, one additional item. We, we heard interest from a commissioner on receiving a report, a report from uh, Public Works. Uh, they, did, they had a recent trip to the Netherlands where several Public Works staff and a few other city staff uh, went to the Netherlands and uh, learned about uh, you know, all the amazing bike transportation work going on there. Um, it was funded through like the Dutch you know, bike programs. They, they bring people over often to teach their wise ways on, <laughs> on these things. And so uh, Public Works learned quite a bit, have a lot to say on that. Uh, and they are looking forward to talking with you all sometimes. So they have a presentation created already. They presented to the Transportation Commission uh, last month and are happy to come back to Planning Commission too. And I will work on scheduling that with them. So if you'll see that on a future agenda. So I requested this, it's super cool. <coughs> and I, even Renee Calder, who's uh, famously doesn't like to bike, is like, I kind of like to bike a little bit now. So okay. uh, I wanted to bring that awesomeness here and unify it with what we're doing already with density and everything, just because it'll be fun. So make sure it's not an extra pain for Matt, but I'm really looking forward to that. And yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to that too. I've, I've talked with uh, Matt Starkey a little bit on the trip and it sounded very exciting and insightful. And if the Dutch have extra funding for planning commissioners, <laughs> like, don't be shy. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine that will get use more than once if they come up with something also. The current planning division is looking at more tropical places, but <laughs> we have more. <laughs> um, I have one more update for you. If you were you done, Matt? Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, you probably all recall the food bin project. So that one went to council, and they um, approved the project but denied the storage units that were included. I think there were 12. Um, so that one, we did receive a um, writ of mandate from the um, architect and the property owner. And so um, there, were, there were several concerns laid out in that document, but um, one of them being that um, the denial of the storage units was in conflict with some of the things in the Housing Accountability Act. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that clarification. Appreciate that. Um, Okay, so it sounds like, thank you for that update. There is, it's been pending. It sounds like there's, um, at this time, no items for the October 3rd agenda, but we'll wait and see. Something could still come up. Correct. Um, okay, and we uh, have no subcommittee or advisory um, bodies right now. Do we have items referred for future ad agenda? I don't believe we do. Um, with that, um, I just wanted to mention just that there's a public hearing or public community meeting for 1024 Cayuga neck uh, or 1020. Yeah, I guess it's SoCal technically, right? Corner of Cayuga and SoCal on September 16th. If anybody's seen that application and wants to hop on that Zoom meeting. Is and that, that the former Grace Church? Yeah, that one? it is. Yeah. <laughs> It's and it's back. not on the agenda, um, but uh, we could take information about it. And I'm. Oh, sir. Is yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, no thank you for that. That's thank fine. you for that announcement. So we can't yeah. discuss it at length, even yeah, though we, we may want to. <laughs> um, that is an SB 330 only application. So they are only looking to lock in under SB 330. And they've told us that they are still working on the design. So okay. we've been a lot of feedback on the design. Okay. <laughs> no um, Good. But this is the opportunity for the public and anyone else to. <laughs> weigh in on the design any other concerns before they start you know revising and and finalizing okay all right thank, no 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 thank you for that i would have jumped in but we don't have the opportunity to have a lot of discussion about it um so with that this meeting is adjourned thank you everybody it's nice to see you all no you're allowed to see you all it's been far too long